I'm looking forward to uh, this conversation that we get to have together. Uh, our church is in the middle of a relationship series, a love series called Loveology. Uh, and I want you to know something today that wherever you are in your relationship skill, because relationships take skill. It takes like attributes, like you have to be good at relationships or there's gonna be some sad people in your life, but you can actually improve your relationship skills. Some of you should be very excited for that because that person next to you is not quite a lost cause yet. They can improve. Um, and so I'm excited for that we've been in this series, but I've also noticed that uh, you guys, the adults, the main congregation of New Life Church is not the only ones who would benefit from a relationship series. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm the youth pastor here at New Life Church. And I know that with Valentine's Day, around, like everyone's just an extra little bit, everyone's a little more lovey. Everyone's a little bit more uh, wanting relationships, maybe not wanting relationships, wherever. But I decided we wanted to do one for our students. And with a relationship series with students, I got to say, it's a unique challenge. I'm talking to sixth graders. At the same time, I'm talking to 12th graders. And they could not be different from one another as far as relationships are concerned. It's just hilarious. You have sixth graders who come in and I'm like, oh, please be not in a relationship. And they're telling me they have girlfriends and boyfriends. And I'm like, like, what does that even mean? Like, how do you, as a sixth grader, what do you do? Like, oh, and I, we're like walking through the hall and like, I kind of made my shoulder touch hers. I'm like, fantastic. You guys are in love. But then you have high schoolers who are way too into it. It's like, they're like, they love, like love each other. And I'm like, whoa, calm down. Like she's pretty. Okay. There's lots of pretty people out there, but like, just chill a little bit. But it's the questions, the questions that people ask in a relationship series just make me crack up just a little bit. For example, recently I was talking to a young man and he asked me, Pastor Trevor, how do I know if I'm mature enough to be in a relationship? And I was like, whoa, that is a good question to ask. Just the fact that you're noticing that maturity is involved in relationships, you're probably pretty close. Like some girl would be happy to be in a relationship with you. But then you also have questions like, Trevor, how far can I go in a relationship? Like, can I hold hands? Can we, can we make out, Trevor? Like, and that, that's awkward for me because you probably have rules and I don't, we haven't had that conversation. And what am I supposed to say? Like, okay, well, I, your mom probably said, like, it's just, no, it's weird. So I try to stay away from that one. But here's the question that is really like difficult for me to answer. And it's the question, Trevor, how do I know if they're the one? I don't know. I know you have stress and pressures at work. Like you have like contracts you have to nail down, clients you have to acquire, you have like deadlines you have to meet, but I get to sign off and co-sign on people's have, happily ever after. Like, it's like, I'm like, okay, what, what do I do here? Like, do I say, no, they're bad? Like, they, they want me to say yes, right? So it's just, it's challenging. But then like this last week, <laughs> this last week I'm in a small group with sixth grade boys and they, like, a kid asked me, like seriously asks me, is it Trevor, is it necessary for us to brush our teeth? And I'm like, yes, like what are you talking about? Is it necessary? Like, yes, like in fact, floss, here you go. Like, let me give you, like, let me help you out. No, but it's fun. It's fun asking these questions. And here we are on a Sunday morning and none of you are asking any of those questions probably. But uh, I know that even though that was a unique room to uh, have those conversations with, this is also a unique room. Because as I look out into this audience, I see so many different kinds of people on the relationship spectrum. I see people who have probably been married for years, who are happily married and thriving in their marriage. And let me say thank you that you are setting the model for the rest of us on what a healthy marriage looks like. Yeah, that's amazing, thank you. But on the same hand, there's people who their relationship is on the rocks and there's probably maybe some conversations being had like, do we wanna continue in this? This is not easy. There's also people in here who are probably single and just fine. And there's probably people in here who are single and sick of being single. I don't know where you are on the relationship spectrum today, but I want us to rally around the thought that wherever you are on this spectrum, God's word applies to you. That God's word can actually improve your ability to have relationships. That God's word can literally breathe life into your marriage. God's word can breathe life into your season of singleness. God's word can bring life where there is almost death. God's word applies to you and I think we can rally around that thought today. And so speaking of God's word, we've been in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which has kind of been like our, uh, our, our theme for this whole month. And so I wanna read the part uh, that we're gonna be focusing on today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy. 
It does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and today's focus, it keeps no record of wrongs. So to talk about this topic today, to open it up, I'm going to tell you a story. And since we're talking about love, I'm going to share a story where the setting is like synonymous with love. You'd be like, oh, totally, love football field. That's what I'm thinking. I'm going to tell you a football story. Um, (laughs) It's okay if you don't like football because this is not a a football story as much as it is a story of friendship, Uh, a story of standing up for someone who needs you to stand up for them. And really, it's a story about revenge. And so when I was a senior, uh, I went to a small Christian high school. And uh, so we went to this football camp down in San Diego where we played like this bunch bigger schools. Like we were always the smallest school. We would always just get destroyed by these much bigger, stronger men. And here we are like 17, like, ah, like, pfft, like it was like not fun. But so uh, here we are at this camp and uh, it was a long week of us just getting demolished by these bigger teams. And we went against the best team on the last day and everyone was very afraid of this team. And I was just like, okay, whatever, let's just get this over with. And so here I am standing on my side of the field and the play goes away from me. So I run after the play, I'm kind of jogging. I wanna make sure that everyone thinks that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I see that uh, one of my teammates is like kind of just drifting by himself. The play is passed, but all of a sudden, someone from the opposing team just comes and hits my friend square in his chest. His legs go in the air, and it was like a hard hit, but it wasn't really necessary. And I took that personally. I saw that, and I was like, you're not going to do that to my friend. That's my teammate. You might have hit him in the chest, but I'm going to hit you back in your back. And so I'm sprinting at him, and he's standing over my friend, and I just with all my force, chest, shoulder, helmet, right into his numbers in his back, and he goes flying. In that moment, it felt really good. <laughs> like, really, I don't know if, you, if you've never experienced what it feels like. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it to you, but it's really good. But in that moment, it felt really good until I turned around and saw what I thought was gonna be all my teammates. Like, yeah, Trevor, way to stand up for our friend. No, it was the other team, and they were very angry. And they were trying to hit me and cuss at me and all these things that I realized that in a moment, what felt really good turned into a big problem. And the problem wasn't just my problem because the next time we line up at the play, everyone's like, we're coming for you. This is craziness. But I know that sometimes the things that we celebrate in sports, aggression, acts of strength, those things are not necessarily celebrated by Jesus. It's the things in our society that are are sometimes promoted in some situations are are not the things that we would find celebrated and highlighted in Scripture. The things that we find on social media that our culture would promote and put on a pedestal, if we would go back 2,000 years and walk with Jesus, he would not be promoting those same things. I think sometimes it's the things that we most want to go after naturally or the things that we tend to go towards uh, just because of our feelings, sometimes those are the things that are most opposite of the kingdom of God, and so I want to talk about that. Here we are on a Sunday, and I'm excited to, uh, to kind of go into this, but I think that sometimes the, our world would say things like, stand up for yourself. I'm sure if someone has heard that before, that you need to stand up for yourself, but that is not found anywhere in the Bible. In fact, the Bible would say to lay down your life and to pick up your cross. Our world would say something like, look at me, when Jesus says, follow me. Our world would say things like, how could they possibly do that to you when a Christian's response should always be, how can I serve you? You see, when we naturally go to the things that we naturally go to, I think we inadvertently create in us a a feeling of needing to feel defensive to protect us from something else. But I got to let you know today that a defensive Christian is not very useful for God. A a Christian who's always trying to like protect themselves and keep other people at a distance is not walking or running the race that God would have for them. I think sometimes we think we have to uphold our reputation. But if you're upholding your reputation at the expense of cutting down Jesus's, I'm not sure what we're really doing. If we have to nurture our feelings to the point of removing us from any threat, then I don't know if that's what Jesus would have for us as a Christian. I hear this sometimes. I think it's really well-intentioned that we need to protect our peace, which peace is good. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. But nowhere in Scripture do we find Jesus protecting his peace. 
Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he doesn't need protecting. And so I think that we need to be more vulnerable and not so defensive as Christians. And so what am I trying to unpack from this today? I think the Bible does not call us to uphold a reputation, to nurture our feelings. It doesn't call us to protect our peace. But the Bible does call us to run a race. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Today, I wanna to talk to you about the weight of unforgiveness. Imagine for a moment that I'm holding a, a 50 pound dumbbell in my hand. If 50 is really heavy, 20. If you don't think I can do that, that's fine. Uh, imagine I'm holding a dumbbell and I'm trying to do this message and I'm holding this dumbbell in my hand. At some point through the course of this message, I would have to put this dumbbell down or it's gonna, be, it's gonna become such a distraction for me that I'm not able to articulate what I believe God has given me to give to you. It, the, the, the weight is going to distract me from the purpose. You see, I think that if I was holding a, a dumbbell, it would be kind of obvious I could just put it down. But some of us are carrying things that are much heavier than a physical dumbbell. It's a spiritual burden called unforgiveness. And I think that God is asking us to not carry that burden any longer. God is asking us to put down the weight of unforgiveness. Are you seeing uh, what I'm saying? Unforgiveness, listen to this, is a self-imposed burden. Self-imposed burden that is keeping you from running the race God set before you. Notice I didn't say that the pain someone else causes you is self-imposed. I think we would all agree that someone abusing you is not self-imposed. Someone wronging you is not self-imposed. However, I think there becomes a point where the pain has now just become a burden that we're calling unforgiveness and we're holding on to it. We're keeping on to it. And I think that there's a reason we'll get into that in just a moment. But I think today could be the day. In fact, I want to believe that today is a day for, that for some of us, we are going to find freedom through forgiveness. I'm a father of three boys, uh, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and an eight-month-old. <laughs> I love, I heard, oh my God, I heard, yeah, I heard, I heard like every different reaction right there. And that's usually what we get. First service was just silent. And I was like, Sorry. Um, no, but so I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and an eight-month-old. My life is fun. It's all the time. It's busy. Uh, so the other day, I'm sitting on my couch. The boys are playing, and my four-year-old Tanner, who's very thoughtful, very, uh, um, um, he likes to build things, which is not me at all. Like, him and his mom, they, for fun, they do, like, puzzles. And I'm talking, like, 2,000-piece puzzles. I'm like, I can't even do a 2,000-piece puzzle. Well, so Tanner, the, the other day in the morning, he is building a Lego set. Uh, and I don't know how many pieces it was, whatever it was. He's building this Lego set, and he, like, takes about an hour to do it, which is amazing, a four-year-old, for an hour focusing on building something. And so he finishes it. He brings it to me. He's like, Daddy, look at my Lego set. And I'm like, whoa, that's a, that's a cool ice cream truck, buddy. And so he's, like, showing it to me. And he's like, the, the, the problem where Tanner messed up is he puts the ice cream truck down. And he puts it over there. And he goes and does something else. I also have another son. His name is Luca. And uh, Luca is two, and Luca is not the same as Tanner. Tanner is, or Luca's very impulsive. He's like, oh, this will be fun. Let's do it. And he doesn't even think about it. And so Luca walks up, sees this ice cream truck, and he picks it up. And I'm, I don't know what was going on in his head, but he, for some reason, just smashes it on the ground. Like, there was no thinking, just smash. Tanner hears the commotion comes running in to see what happened, and he sees his ice cream truck, and he starts yelling, as you would if someone smashed your ice cream truck. And so he sees, he sees Thomas the Train right here, and uh, Tanner grabs Thomas the Train and is about to turn this thing into Thomas the Airplane. And he's about to lock this thing in, and as he's holding it, I see this, and I go, Tanner, put it down. Did he throw it? I don't know, I'll, I'll let you decide. <laughs> Today I want to talk to you and encourage you to put down Thomas the Airplane, to put down the burden that you carry, to put down the weight of unforgiveness. 
Matthew chapter 18, there's a story where Jesus is communicating uh, unforgiveness and he tells a parable and it's found here. Let's read it. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, say gold, Gold. was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver, say silver, silver silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And it ends with this. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. First thing I want to communicate from this story, and this is my best point, this is my all. If you take nothing else from this talk, take this home. Is that you will always be more indebted to God's grace than anyone could possibly be indebted to yours. I think someone needs to take their phone out, take a picture of that, memorize that, receive that quote, get it tattooed somewhere on your body. But that is a quote that is powerful because when we understand the grace that's been shown to us, it changes how we go and show grace. Peter asks a question to start this story off and he asks Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone? Should I forgive someone seven times? And Peter's not bringing out a a random number here. If you do research and go into what he's trying to communicate, uh, the the Old Testament like law at that time, according to Amos chapter two, was that we should forgive three, maybe four times. Imagine that if you only had to forgive your spouse three or four times, and then they're on their own. Like, hey, I'm following what the Bible says. So Peter is literally asking this question, giving this response so that Jesus will be impressed with him. Like he thinks he's gonna be like, oh, good job, Jesus. Or good job, Peter. Like you're finally starting to get it. And Jesus is like, what a dumb question. Like what are we talking about here? Because I think sometimes it's our questions that we ask that either show a misunderstanding of Jesus and God or the questions we ask actually expose a, a hidden something in our hearts. And so Jesus needs to work through the condition of Peter's heart because he's not getting it. And so he says, no, not seven times. I'm talking 77 times. And to be honest, if Peter would have said 77 times, Jesus probably would have said no, 777 times. Because it's not about an amount, it's about the heart. I think that Jesus, uh, we would probably, most of us agree with this, that Jesus more so is about multiplication than he is addition. If you look in the Old Testament, we see God take Abraham, who was just one dude, turned him into a mighty nation of people. If you look at uh, uh, Jesus on earth, he's taking five loaves of bread and two fish, and he's multiplying it to feed thousands of people. We see so many examples of Jesus, not just moving the needle a little bit. No, in the New Testament, the Bible says, do not murder. Jesus says, yeah, don't even be angry. Don't commit adultery. No, don't even like lust after a woman. Jesus is exponentially increasing Not just, Jesus isn't like, oh no, let's just do the bare minimum seven times and then they're cut out. But I think we would all be glad that Jesus didn't have that same approach to us. And so I think that if we want to tap into the way of living that Jesus lived, we have to live according to his equation. That it's not about seven. 
It's about seven times seven. It's about 77 times 77. Like Jesus is upping the standard for what it means to show grace, to show mercy, so that we can walk in the freedom that's available to living how Jesus lived. And so I want that for you today, to live in the freedom that's found in forgiveness. But I also love the two debts that Jesus uses to communicate in this story. If we go back, there's three characters, right? You've got the king, we have the man, and we have the fellow servant. The man in the middle is the one who deals with both people. To the king, he owes 10,000 talents, 10,000 bags of gold. I did a little research on this, and one talent equaled 20 years of work, which also brings, never mind, I'm not even gonna go there. One talent equals 20 years of work. That equals 200,000 years of work this man owed. 200,000. You're not gonna live that long. A lot of people, the biblical scholars, believe that this was not the debt that one man could possibly ever acquire on his own, but rather it was probably the debt of a whole nation, and it was bestowed upon one man. Isn't that symbolic for what Jesus would do for us? That Jesus would carry the debt of the world, just like this man carried the debt of his nation. And so this man owes 200,000 years of work, and what does he ask for? He says, Jesus, or King, just give me more time. Like, that's going to make a dent. 200,000 years of work, 10,000 bags of gold. But then on this end, he is owed 100 silver coins, 100 uh, denarius. And if you do the research, it shows that one denarius is equal to one day of work. So this man owed this man 100 days of work. This is what I love about this story. 100 days of work is still 100 days of work. It's still a debt that is sizable that is owed. Jesus, through talking about forgiveness, never diminishes the pain you feel because of another person. Never once does Jesus say, yeah, you should just get over it. It wasn't that big of a deal. That's not the heart of God. However, when you look at the hundred silver coins that are owed you, compared to the 10,000 bags of gold you owe God, you will never be owed more than you already owe. God has already displayed so much grace on you. When we hold up our offenses to the reality of a perfect God, not only do we just owe more, we owe infinitely more. Our sin against an infinitely perfect and holy God are infinitely more. No one has ever hurt you like you hurt God. And yet God in his kindness, God in his mercy, The king in this story, he doesn't just try to get the money back. No, he cancels the debt. God has canceled your debt. And maybe forgiveness should start with you forgiving your own debt. That for whatever you've done in the past, your your story, maybe you need to start there at a place of forgiving yourself for what you allowed to happen or what you chose to do. (laughs) Forgiveness is a beautiful thing, but unforgiveness is ugly. I, I don't think we could talk about Forgiveness being so beautiful if we don't talk about unforgiveness being ugly. So here's the second thing for you to understand. Unforgiveness, I believe, is less about paying someone back and more about making them pay. You guys heard that saying, like, I'm going to make them pay. You're not actually going to, like, repay the payment. No, it's just the statement. I'm going to make them pay. You see, the master wanted everything sold. The man, the wife, the child, all the possessions. Because he was trying to recoup what he had lost. There's some logic in there. But the man in the story, he throws his servant into prison. Now, why would he do that? I, as you probably understand, there is no ability to make money in prison. There's no chance that this guy is ever going to get his hundred silver coins because this man's rotting away in prison. And yet we do the same thing when we aren't seeking reconciliation, but we're seeking power and control over a situation. That person hurt me. And so now I want to have power over how I feel about them. I want to have control over how I feel, what they feel to me, all these different things. We want to have control over situations. You see how unforgiveness is ugly? Why why does he choke him? He was just showed all this grace and mercy. And his first thought to do was this, man, I'm going to put you in a chokehold. Because unforgiveness is a burden that eats away at you. Unforgiveness is a burden that makes you do things and think things that you wouldn't have thought to do before. We would rather keep people in the prison of our unforgiveness 
so we can have control over an issue, have power over the person that hurt us. Did you notice how the story ended though? Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. You see, this is a parable. And a parable is a uh, story of a physical event to display a spiritual truth. And I think that Jesus is saying, hey, unforgiveness is a weight that you mean to hurt someone else. But in reality, unforgiveness will come back and choke you. Notice what he said in that verse. He says that uh, uh, he's thrown to the jailers to be tortured. The jailer was himself. The jailer is his own bitterness. The, the jailer, the, the torture is his own thoughts. The, that's for us. The bitterness, un, or resentment, unforgiveness is a jailer that corrupts us from the inside. What you have to know about forgiveness is that forgiveness is not letting someone off the hook, but it's letting them off your hook. It's not saying, hey, it's all good, no worries. It's not saying, hey, like, no problem, it's okay. No, but it's saying, hey, it's okay with me. Like, it's, I, I can afford to be offended by sometimes because I've been exponentially forgiven of more. Forgiveness is not letting them off the hook, but it's letting them off your hook. Third thing, last thing, I'm gonna close with this. Trevor, forgiveness is not easy. Granted, 100% agree with you. And in your strength and your power, it probably is impossible. But forgiveness is possible through the power of the cross. So number three in your notes, let me say it right. The power to forgive is found in the cross. When I think of Jesus and I think of his ministry here on earth, he did a lot of great things. He taught about the kingdom of God. He healed many people. But to go to the cross, I feel like it was for a, a, a purpose rooted in forgiveness. Because Jesus healed many people before he ever went to the cross. Jesus taught about the kingdom of God before he ever went to the cross. But the reason he went to the cross is because we had a debt that we had to pay. And just like there's no chance of us paying 200,000 years of work, there is no chance in us bringing perfection to a perfect God. And Jesus, while he's on the cross paying your payment, looks out on the people who did this to him. And what does he say in Luke chapter 23, 34? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. What a picture. That Jesus finishing what he came to this planet to do and he's showing us how to do it while he's doing the thing he came here to do. I want to let you know that I don't know if there's a more Christ-like quality, Christ-like attribute, a more Christ-like thing you can do than to forgive someone. Because when you forgive, you are showing people Jesus. When you forgive, you are showing people the power of the cross. You can be full of joy and a non-Christian, I think you can forgive and be a non-Christian, but forgiveness gives nothing for you. It's forgiveness that Jesus came for this planet. And on the cross, he cries out for forgiveness. I'm gonna close with a story of a lady named Corey Ten Boom. Raise your hand, have you heard, have you heard this lady, Corey Ten Boom? Oh, good amount, awesome. There was a lady named Corey Ten Boom who uh, grew up in Europe during uh, World War II and she was a survivor of World War II, a survivor of horrible atrocities. Her and her family were captured for protecting the Jewish people from the Nazis. Uh, and her family was put in a Nazi concentration camp. While she's there for a number of years, both her parents are executed. Her and her sister are raped and her sister ends up passing away, but she miraculously gains freedom. So she felt after this horrible thing had happened to me, I'm gonna go and tell people about the forgiveness of God. So that's what she does. She travels around Europe, travels around the world, and tells people a message similar to what we're discussing today, forgiveness. Putting down the burden, the weight of unforgiveness. One day she's in a certain meeting and she finishes her talk. People are coming up to her saying, great, great talk, thank you so much, that was, I needed that, I'm going through whatever. But one man comes up to her and he says, you don't remember me, but I remember you. See, I was one of those security guards in one of those concentration camps you were a part of. And he says this line to her. He says, I know God has forgiven me, but will you? 
That's powerful. And in this moment, this woman is confronted with the worst evil she can imagine, personified, the representation of everything done to her family, the representation of losing her sister, all of these things, and here it is standing in front of her. I love going back and reading her memoirs when she says that she felt wrong that this guy thought that he could just ask for forgiveness and it all be taken care of. She talks about a coldness gripping her heart, like I'm sure some of you have towards certain people because of the things that they've done to you. But then she goes on to say, but forgiveness is not a feeling, it's an act of the will. And she said that in that moment, she prays, Jesus, help me. And although I don't know if I can forgive right now, I can do something to start this path of forgiveness. And she raises her hand and shakes that man's hand. Man, I wanna believe that for you today, there are, there, there's something that you need to forgive. And this isn't just forgiveness for forgiveness sake. This is forgiveness so that you can run the race that God has set before you. I'm done being a defensive Christian, feeling like I need to protect my name. No, I don't care if people do something because I can afford that because I've been infinitely forgiven and I have a purpose to run. I have a race to run and forgiveness has no part in that. So I wanna invite you to stand to your feet. We're about to sing some songs, but I wanna believe that for today, there is an opportunity for you to find freedom in forgiveness. And if the prayer partners want to come up to the front, I wanna lead by saying something that just like Corey Tim Boom made a physical response to start forgiveness, maybe your physical response is not to lift your hands because that person's not here, but maybe it's to take a step and come on up to the front and have someone pray for you. I wanna invite you to putting down the burden of unforgiveness. I wanna invite you to experience the freedom that's found in doing the most Christ-like thing you can do, and that's forgiving. Can I pray for you? God, you're awesome. Lord, you are amazing. God, when I think of the mercy you've shown me, God, I'm blown away. God, no one will ever need my grace more than I need yours. And God, if I'm honest, unforgiveness is ugly. God, I wanna choose forgiveness that's found in the power of the cross. And so God, for every single person here today, God, this is a, a great message to hear, but God, this is terribly difficult to live out. God, would you give us the tenderness of heart to match yours? The pity that the king had on the servant to not just give time to try to make things right, because God, there are people in our, that we don't even wanna make things right with, but God, we can still forgive. So God, let that start with us. Let that start in this room. Let that start with our hearts let us start with us coming forward for prayer as a representation of wanting to find forgiveness. God, I'm thankful for every person here. God, be with them in every other situation, scenario they find. God, thank you that you show us how to forgive so that we can run the race that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name.